Y'all this morning. I don't know why I said y'all. I'm not down south. I'm in Missouri. But how are you doing today? Yeah. Hey, man, it's uh, wonderful to be here with my family. And you guys are family. And um, I never want you guys to ever forget that, how much of a family you are to us. And I'm so thankful that we're here today, get to worship God. The, the music's been wonderful. And as you see, I am not Brownie. Brownie is uh, just a little shorter than I am, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah right. But no, uh, um, I think I, I was sharing, I may have shared with you guys before, I was in, in, uh, in town a few weeks ago, and this, this little boy looked at me and goes, Brownie! He looked at me, you're Brownie! I was like, no, man, I'm not even close to Brownie, right? And so some people started calling me, like, you're the little Brownie, like little Brownie mini-me. I think it's this and this. Started calling me Brownie Bite. You know, you're Brownie Bite is what you are, <laughs> you know. That's all right. It's all good. Our pastor right now, he's down south with a, a man by the name of Richard Cummings. If you know Richard, <laughs> He's, he was part of this church from the very inception, I believe, and when I came to be a part of this church back in 1999, he was a member here, and um, I remember back during that time, um, he, he played, Rich Cummings played the guitar, he also sang, and I played a little bit of the bass, just a little, that's it, that's why you don't see me up here now, it was just a little, and, uh, and then a guy by the name of Jay Williams played the drums. And we would get together at Jay's house and practice down below, even though nothing really developed of it. We just enjoyed playing, enjoyed the fellowship. It was fun. Um, but I remember we were standing outside uh, in Jay's driveway, and I was talking to Rich, and <coughs> excuse me, I said, hey, um, do you think you're ever going to be a pastor? He goes, oh, no, no, never. I'll never be a pastor. That's something I've not been called to do. Well, you know how long he's been pastoring now? <laughs> For like about 15 years, I think, and... And now God has led him down south, and he's taken a pastor down there, um, and um, he's asked Brownie to go down there and to, I believe, for a, a men's conference, and then Brownie's preaching this week. So please keep our pastor in your prayers. He's sharing the word down there, and he's asked me to fill in here, which is, which is a great honor. And, um, and so I was praying about what the Lord might have me to preach this week. There's a few different studies that I've been in. Um, and, uh, and where God led me was back to the book of Ephesians. And if you are part of Refined, and you're in here and you're part of Refined group, our, our Refined group, it's uh, young singles. So if you're an 18 to, uh, this is my plug, if you're 18 to 25 years old and you want to be a part of a ministry, we have what we call Refined. We get together on Tuesday nights at 6.30 here in the coffee house. So you're more than welcome to come. And um, we've been going over the book of Ephesians from the beginning of the year. And we started a series called, Where Do I Fit? Where Do I Fit? Because this book really is about the body of Christ. It's about the body of Christ. And it's really neat how it begins, how it ends. We'll talk about that. Um, and so if you are in Refine and you're in here, well, then you're getting a double dose of Ephesians. It's just the way that God led it, right? And uh, it's been a blessing because with them, we've been going through the benefits of being a believer and also the responsibilities of the church and the responsibilities of the believers. So that's kind of how it's divided up. And uh, we're all the way over in Ephesians chapter 4. I think we'll be starting chapter 5 coming up. So as I prayed, God kind of laid this on my heart to continue. And so with that, that's where we're going to be today in the book of Ephesians. So if you have your Bibles, you can flip over to Ephesians chapter 2. That's where we're going to begin. But kind of giving you a backstory here, Ephesians first shows up in Acts chapter 18, verse 19, at the end of Paul's second mission trip. This is when it, it shows up and we see it first mentioned. But again, Paul arrives back in Ephesus on his third missionary journey, and we see that around Acts chapter 19, verse 1. So this is when he, Ephesus is coming into play with his journeys. And according to Acts chapter 20, verse 31, it tells us that he spent three years with this church. Three years is a long time to spend with a group of people. And when you spend that kind of time with some people, you're going to get to know them pretty good. They're going to get to know you. 
You're going to be very intimate with them. They're going to learn what you like, what you don't like, and vice versa. And Tammy and I and Titus, we can really relate to this because when, when God led us over to Zambia, that's about how long we were with them. Now, we were back and forth there more, but I'm talking boots on the ground, living there, ministering was about three years plus. Three years for her, about four years for me um, total. And in that time, we grew a great love for the people of Zambia. The nationals there are very special to me. Um, they are family to me. They're not just a, a, a ministry. They are family. Um, they're not just someone we teach word to. We are family together. And we still are in contact together and uh, sharing with me the struggles. And I'm sharing with them the, the thoughts and ideas of what's going on over here and however we can help. So that just shows you the intimacy that we had, right? that we have together. Well, Paul had the exact same type of intimacy. And at the end of his, his journey in Acts chapter uh, uh, 20 there, he's on his way back to Jerusalem. He stops at Miletus, and he calls for the leaders to come to him from Ephesus because there's some things he wants to charge them with. See, he knows this is the last time that he's going to, to speak to these men. See, it's different with us. I, can, I talked with Pastor Pule just two days ago. He's a pastor over in Zambia on WhatsApp. But back then, they knew this is the last time, and so there were some things on Paul's heart that he wants to share, that he wanted to share with him. So I'm just going to give you a, a highlight in Acts chapter 20 of things that he shared with them. It says here that he told them, he goes, I, I, I kept back nothing from you. I declared the full, the whole counsel of God. I gave that to you. You know, and, and like I've heard before that um, there's been those who have said, look, I've, I've taught you everything you know, but I haven't taught you everything I know, right? Well, that's not the way Paul's approach. Paul's was, I've taught you everything I know. Everything that God invested into me, I've invested into you. I've given you everything. He charged them, he charged the leadership to feed the church of God, with, which was purchased by the, the blood of God himself. That's what the passage says. It says he was purchased with his own blood. See, this is a great passage of deity. But he's a challenge them, and he's saying, hey, we, you need to feed the flock. You need to take care of them. Don't forget them. Make sure that you're taking care of them in every way which you can, because remember the price that was paid in order to bring them into the flock. See, that's how serious it was with Paul. He understood this. He warned them of wolves that were going to come from without and from within. He said, there's going to be people coming in with an agenda to try to break this up. And there's also, by the way, people from within that are going to try to break this up. You see, this, this epistle, this letter is not just for Ephesus. It's for us here today. These books that were written by Paul for us. So that tells us, guess what? We live in a world where there's going to be people with an agenda that's going to try to break up what's happening at First Bible and other Bible teaching and preaching churches. But I assure you, there are some from within that have an agenda. That's what the Bible says, right? And prayerfully, that's not going to take place. That the love of God, the love of Christ that we see here is going to permeate through this, and the truth will continue to move forward, and none of that will take place. But he also taught them of the responsibility as the church. He said there at the end, it is more blessed to give than it is to receive. So he talked them many things, and these are just a few highlights. But what this does is it really reveals to you the love that Paul had for the church. And it was a genuine love. It was a real love. Now, when he wrote this church, this is what you call one of the four prison epistles. He was in prison when he wrote this, this epistle we have in front of us, okay? Now, it was probably a bit different what we consider as prison. When you look at Scripture, he was able to come and go. It's almost like he had a, you know, today he'd have an ankle bracelet on, on right? But still, he was held. And he was trying to talk to, to them and help them understand how they can overcome some things, right? And he was trying to show them the love that he had for them when he wrote this epistle. I'm not talking about Acts. I'm talking about this epistle of Ephesians, okay? So he wrote this letter from a prison. But I want you to understand, too, when he wrote this letter, it wasn't to correct problems. It was to prevent them. Brownie's been taking us for through, through 1 Corinthians and that is an epistle, that is a, a letter on correction. He's correcting some things that have gone wrong. And here, there's no correction, 
He's just trying to share some things from his heart from prison to help prevent some things from happening. That's pretty important and pretty important to understand. He wants them to know that through this prevention, that there are some things that they can overcome in their life. And it's the same message that we have today. What's interesting, I like about this book that really reflects our individual walk, is if you read it from cover to cover, or from chapter 1 to chapter 6, it begins with heaven, but it ends with a spiritual warfare. It begins in chapter 1 of all the things that we get. We're accepted, we're beloved, we have redemption. All these pieces that are connected with Christ in heaven, but then at the end there, he says, oh, but you're going to have a spiritual battle in your life. You're going to have to do some fighting. And that's where we're going with today. These are the, some of the things that God is, is wanting us to understand. But I love how he, he kind of divided this book up. And he did it through our posturing. He did it through mankind's posturing. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, there's three words that he used throughout chapters 2 and all the way through 6. And these three words are sit, walk, and stand. He used that terminology to help us understand of how it begins with heaven, but how it ends with a spiritual battle. And you can overcome through all of that if you just understand how to sit and you understand how to walk and you know how to stand. And that's where God is leading us today because he wants us to know the same thing. So I'm going to pray. And then what we're going to do is we're going to um, get into the scriptures here and read some scripture. There'll be some scripture up there you can read. We're going to go into our Bibles and read some other scriptures. Um, but I'm going to pray first, and then we'll get in here and see what God's going to show us. Father God, we, uh, we are 100% dependent upon you today. There is not one thing that we can do on our own. Your word clearly tells us that. And we're asking, Father God, that you would watch over our pastor as he's down south, that he's preaching and bringing forth the word of God to challenge this church, to challenge this other shepherd to continue to move, not to give up, to apply some things. These challenges, Lord God, are so essential for the body of Christ today. And Lord God, I'm asking the same for us. Throughout this church right now, children are being ministered to and youth, and there's other adults over here at the Sunday studies, Lord, and and the uh, Lord taking place right now. And if you're not here, if your power and your spirit is not moving, uh, then that's it. We're just here. But Father God, with you here, you can move mountains. You can make the crooked straight. You can do so many things. Of that, And that's how we invite you, Lord God, to meet with us now. We are in dire need of you, Lord God. We live in a world that is twisted and perverted. And without you, there's no hope. But with Christ in you, with you, Lord God, is everything we would ever need. So we're asking right now you would open up our eyes and our hearts and help us to understand the book of Ephesians and what you're trying to teach us and what you showed them so many thousand years ago, but Lord, it's still apl applicable to today. So Lord God, we love you and praise you. Meet with us now. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So our first point of study that we see here is our eternal position is in Christ. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ. And this is something that should take us back to kind of in October of last year. Because at our Acts 1-8 conference, what was it? Our Acts 1-8 conference was in Christ alone. In Christ alone. And just in this book, in Ephesians, 35 times or more, there's about 35 times that in Christ or its equivalent is mentioned. In Christ, through Christ, as Christ. All these things can be found. So if the Holy Spirit saw fit to have Paul the Apostle write that phrase down this many times. There's something he's trying to teach us. We have to open up our ears to that. We can't let that go by. And that's what we see here. He says, we are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Just in chapters 1 through 3, we see that phrase 10 times. Kind of neat. Do your own study. Go through and find those things. Those are the things that God wants us to see. So when a person is seated, just like you guys are right now, you all right now are in a place of rest, aren't you not? Now, again, I know there's always exceptions to the rule. But right now, everybody's at a place of rest. You're listening. Your hearts are open. Spirit of God is moving. It's a beautiful place to be. That's what's taking place in your life. And right here, it says that we are seated with him in heavenly places. 
That means right now in Christ, we are at a place of rest. Well, I don't know about you, but you might be saying, I've got this happen, I've got this happen. Yeah, I get it. But spiritually, you're in a place of rest right now. That's where you're seated. Jesus Christ said this, Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So you come unto him, you enter into his body, you enter into his life, and immediately you have rest, and you're seated with him in heavenly places. This is present tense. This is present tense. So it may be a little bit difficult for us to understand it, and I get it. I really do. I understand that. So how? How are we in him? How are we part of the body? Well, John chapter 15, verse 5 says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in, in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. And this is self-explanatory, but it says right here, he says, I am the vine. So, in other words, he is the source of life. And he says, I am the source of life. You think about a tree. That tree has that source of life from underground. And what does it do? It feeds the branches. And those branches now have life because of the source of life. But if you see a broken branch off the tree laying on the ground, there's no source of life in that. It's going to wither and it's going to die. It might look like that tree for a while, but eventually it's going to wither and it's going to die. And see, that's how we are with him. Now, here's the thing. If you don't know Christ as your Savior, you're that branch laying right next to the tree right now. And you might look alive, but you're not according to Scripture because he is our source. We have to enter into him for him to be our source of life. So when you place your faith and trust in Christ, he picks up that branch and he grafts it right back into himself. And now, supernaturally, you have life. Isn't that not amazing? Isn't that amazing? Man, that's, that's what it's like about being a part of his body. But you've got to enter into him first. So let's look back, though. We've got to look back sometimes before we can look forward. So where was it that we sat? So up here is a reference, but go over to Psalm chapter 107. We're going to read these, the scripture here. This is um, where we once sat, if you know Christ as your Savior. In Psalm chapter 107, we're going to look, read verse 10 through 16. I hear the papers a flutter, and that's a nice sound. So it says here in verse 10, Psalm 107, Such as sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, being bound in affliction and iron, because they rebelled against the words of God and contemned the counsel of the Most High. Therefore, he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down, and there was none to help. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them up out of darkness in the shadow of death, and he brake their bands in asunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he had broken the gates of brass, and he had, and cut the bars of iron in asunder. You know, when you look at this, I don't know if you capture, but this is where you were before you met Christ. You know what this is? This is a convict on death row. This is a man who is now in prison. This is a person who has no hope. It says here he's got shackles on. He's sitting in darkness, and he's there in the shadow of death, and he's just waiting for death. The next step is death. That's it. He has no hope whatsoever. Why did he do that? Why is he there? Because they rebelled against the words of God, and they didn't take the counsel of the Most High. See, that's where you were before you met Christ. But when you place your faith in Jesus Christ, what it says right here, he breaks them asunder. That means you can't even put them back on. They're so broken. They're gone. He's cast them away. He's opened up the gate, and you can come out free now. You're made free by the blood of Jesus Christ. See, you're no longer here anymore, church. If you know Christ is your Savior, it's a person on death row. But what happens is, is he enters into a place of rest. He's no longer in that guilt or whatever problem it was that got him there. So the way we exit death row is to enter into that eternal rest. And it's beautiful because we find it here in Ephesians chapter 2. So how do you get out of that grave? How do you get out of that jail cell? Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, 
and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Right there is the answer. If you are here today and you are in that jail cell, if you want out, this is your answer right here. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. That's where you were. You place your faith in Christ. That's where you are right now. Amen? Amen. That's something to be excited about. But here I have another question. So where is Christ? Where is Christ right now? Well, there's many passages in Scripture that says that he right now is seated on the right hand of the Father. But now think about that. Go back to Ephesians 2.6. He says we're seated with him in heavenly places. What does that mean? How does that work for us? And I think it's beautiful when you compare Scripture with Scripture because Revelation chapter 3, verse 21 says this. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne. Isn't that amazing? If you, if you overcome, you get to sit with him in his throne. Even as I also overcame and is set down with, with my father in his throne. So he's saying if you overcome. Here's the thing, guys. We have to understand, church, that if you've met Jesus as your Savior, you have overcome. Because he's the overcomer. And because you've placed your faith and trust in him, he's sitting on the right hand of the Father. You are in him, and your position right now is right next to the Father. Isn't that amazing to you? When I saw this, I was like, that's great. I'm sitting next to the Father in my Lord Jesus Christ right now as I speak. Right as you listen, that's where your position is. Isn't that amazing? That's beautiful. But see, we have to understand that we've overcome. We've even seen it here, but look at this next verse. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. He's overcome whatever it is you're facing right now. Whatever it is you're going through, it's overcomable. You've already overcome it. There is no problem with it. Now, I'm not going to say it's going to be easy, but Jesus overcame it. You are in him next to the Father. If you are in him next to the Father, you've also overcame it. You are part of his body. You are now his conduit, and that's it. He's working in and through you to help overcome whatever situation you have, and it's already victorious. So this is what's a beautiful point. Knowing where you are gives you complete confidence, okay? If you know that you're in Christ right now, that should build inside of you some confidence, some confidence that cannot be broken, Confidence in who you are. Confidence in the battles that you've, you're fighting. Confidence in why you're here and, and what you're supposed to be doing and, and, and how you're supposed to be doing it. That confidence can be real because you are in him. He is in you. You're sitting there. You have access to the Father. See, that's the confidence you and I ought to have. So here's our first point of application. We are seated together in Christ on the throne. You will never overcome this world until you embrace the fact that it has already been overcome. If you're allowing this world to beat you down, if you're getting caught up with what's on TV and all the craziness around the world, then you are not resting in the overcomer, which is Jesus Christ. You've already overcome all that. Your battle is the battle that God places in front of you. That's it. That's all. There's no reason to live in a place of defeat. You have a victory through Jesus Christ. Amen? You got to have that overcome. You got to understand that you've overcome this world. Our second point of study here, we find it in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, do beseech ye that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. So our point here is our temporal position is as Christ. It doesn't say in Christ, it's as Christ. We are to walk worthy of our calling. See, that, that calling, that was your divine invitation to the salvation that you've received. So he invited you. You've said, yes, that's divine. That is the calling that you are in him and you are in Christ. Now, listen to this. The price that was paid for our salvation must be matched by our walk. Now, think about that price. The price cost the father his son. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. He went all the way, and he did not give up. He saw the cross. 
He endured the cross and despised the shame, and he's set down at the right hand of the Father. See, our walk needs to match that because we are in him and he's in us. And the ability is there. It's got to match it. Everyone on this earth walks forward, right? You don't see anybody, and they're less they're making some crazy TikTok video or some crazy video out there. There's, I'm sure there's somebody out there that's made a video, and they walked a mile backwards or five miles back. Okay, that's, that's not the norm, right? The norm is, is we walk forward with our eyes forward so we can see where we're going. So how a person walks says a lot about them. Now, what I'm about to say is subjective, yes, but I think you get the point. So when, when someone's walking fast, you can kind of say, hey, that person's in a hurry, you know. Obviously, it depends on your geographical location, but you might say, hey, they're in a hurry. Someone's walking slow, they might have the time or they just don't care. You know, living in Zambia, walking slow, they have the time. And they do care, but they have the time. It's really a nice way of living. You should try it sometime. <laughs> Amen. We're just slow down the pace of life, and that's where they are at. If somebody's limping around a bit, you know that maybe they're walking limping because they're hurt or maybe born that way or some, there's a, a, an issue in their life. If their head is down, it could be because they're sad or, or broken or depressed. And if their head is up and their chest is out, they're full of pride. So by walking, you see how people are walking says a lot about them. So how does people see your walk in Jesus Christ, as Christ, as you match his walk, you see? Do people see that? Do people see something different in your life? Over here in 4.1, we just read it, but it says that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Well, that word worthy means comparable. That word vocation is calling. So what it's saying here is we are to walk comparable to Christ. That's how you walk worthy. You want to be worthy of what God has called you to do? Walk comparable to him. Walk like him. How he walked, you take those same type of steps. That's how you walk worthy. Knowing where we sit, like we just talked about, it causes us to walk a bit differently than the way the world walks, doesn't it? I mean, if you know that you are sitting in heaven with Jesus that ought to change our walk and the way we approach things and what we look like. Our walk must reflect Jesus Christ. Well, here in, um, in Ephesians also 4 five, and 5, we have some other walks that we're just going to briefly look at. In Ephesians chapter 4, through um, 17 through 19, it talks about walk not as other Gentiles walk. In other words, have a different testimony. Look different than them. Well, what does that mean? You go a little bit further, and it tells you how the Gentiles walk. They walk in the vanity of their mind. That means emptiness. Their thoughts have nothing to do with godly thoughts. The blindness of their heart, their actions, their heart, their attitude has nothing to do with anything that God would have. Lasciviousness. You know what that means? That means lust. They're walking in the lasciviousness, which means lustfulness. It says here, in the uncleanness of and greediness. In other words, they have given themselves over to the flesh. And when I say flesh, I mean desire. That inward, fleshful desire that so many of us are attracted to, that all of us are attracted to at one time or another. Whether we're feeding it or somebody else is feeding it, that's what it's talking about. But it says we're not to walk as a Gentile. Now you have to understand, you are no longer a Gentile today. Three groups of people in the Bible, Jews, Gentiles, and church. You are not a Gentile if you know Christ as your Savior. You are a Christian. Christian means little Christ. That means you walk as Jesus Christ, okay? Your testimony is going to reveal who and what is important to you. So does your testimony point people back to God, or does it point people to yourself, okay? So we're not to walk as other Gentiles walk. Verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 2 says, walk in love as Christ has loved us. Well, I can't think of any other word but sacrifice. You've got to walk in that life of sacrifice. Christ's love can be seen through his sacrifice upon that cross. Like we said earlier, he endured that cross. Now he's sitting at the right hand of the Father. That was the pure love that he showed us. Sacrifice proves your love. 
Our pastor has been taking us through a study called Love Never Fails. Man, and the sacrifice that he's talking about in there, what it takes to prove your love for somebody. It takes a lot. You've got to give all. You've got to give what you have. You've got to give everything. You are a sacrificial offering being made unto the Lord. Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about being that living sacrifice. That means you've got to make a decision to crawl up on that altar and not get off. The altar in the Old Testament, they would bring these sacrifices. And as they were burnt, they would take the dashes out and they would bring another and they would bring another. And Jesus Christ fulfilled all of that. No more sacrifices need to be made for our salvation. But he does ask us that we be a living sacrifice, that we crawl up on that altar and we don't get off at the first sign of trouble. See, that's where we need to live. And if we do this, then we're going to be able to walk in love as Christ has loved us. So does your sacrifice reveal the way you're walking, the way your desire is, is, or is it revealing the walk of Jesus Christ? And then chapter 5, verse 8 says, walk as children of the light. Well, in John chapter 8 and 9, Jesus says he is the light of the world. He lighteth this entire world, and this says that we need to walk as children of the light. We are no longer to walk in the darkness where we once lived, like we just read in Psalm 107. We don't have to go back into that prison. That prison is broken. There's no reason to crawl back into the darkness when we've been made free. So we need to walk as children of the light, not as children of the darkness. Why is it do we keep trying to crawl back into that old jail cell? We shut the door, and guess what? The lock is broke. It can't be locked again. But yet that's where we sit. We need to finally leave that jail cell once and for all and leave it and walk as children of the light. That's what God calls for us to do. A child reflects their father, and our father made us free. And if he is free and he's overcome, that's how we need to live. The Son, therefore, shall make you free. Ye shall be free indeed, always, never to be put back in there. If you go back in, it's on your own volition. Does your walk reveal who your real father is? Or are you pretending to be part of the past father that you once lived in? So these are the walks that it's talking about. And this is a high standard for us to live by, and I know it is. But it's the expectation that God asks for us. But he doesn't tell us to do it on our own. See, walking in the spirit rather than walking in the flesh, that's how we have to choose. That's the only way that we're not going to put ourselves back into that jail cell. Galatians 5, 16 and 6, 17 says, I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the, uh, the, the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. It's a continual battle, and I think you understand that. But if you walk in the Spirit, you're filled with the Spirit, you're controlled by the Spirit, and you've already surrendered, and you don't have a choice anymore. You've given the entire choice to God. So how are you going to do this and to be the overcomer? Go over to John chapter, 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. I know the fourth verse is up there, the next one. But 1 John chapter 4 Verses 1 through 4. It says here, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. He's telling us, you know what, there are those out there being led by different spirits. That's, you know what they're going to do? They're going to entice you and try to get you to go from the truth and do something different that God has not called you to do. Well, how are you to know what spirit is good and what spirit is bad? Look at the next verse. Hereby know ye the spirit of God. If you have the spirit of God inside of you and you're walking with God properly, he will reveal to you the wrong spirits, the things you're supposed to listen to, the things you're not supposed to listen to. He said, every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesses that, that Jesus Christ is come in that not that Jesus Christ has come into the flesh is not of God. And this is that spirit of Antichrist, whereof ye have heard that it should come, and even now already is it, is it in the world. Now look at verse 4. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Amen? So you've overcome those things. We're talking about overcoming here. You're a child of light. Walk as a child of light. 
And if you have the Spirit of God inside of you, you've already overcome them. You've overcome the flesh. You've overcome that which entices the flesh. You're overcome. You've overcome it. Satan and the world will always work together to destroy you and to destroy all that God has in your life. And he's always going to be working with the flesh, these three working together. So our point of application, we are to walk worthy of our Lord Jesus Christ. You will never overcome the lust of the flesh and until you embrace the greatness that is in you. And I'm not talking about your self-greatness. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. It's talking about Jesus. It's not talking about the self-help books out there or the best you. It's not talking about any of that because anything of you is in the flesh cannot please God whatsoever. The only thing that is great in you is that of Jesus Christ himself. So if you embrace that greatness, it's gonna, you're going to understand how to overcome the lust of the flesh. The temptations of Satan in this world are real, and they will always appeal to the flesh. And that's the only way you're going to overcome. And then our last point of study here. Our battle is in God. Now, if you notice, it was in Christ, as Christ, but now in God. Why is that? We're going to see that here in a second. But when you look over at Ephesians chapter 6, it says, Finally, my brethren, verse 10, sorry, verse 10, chapter 6, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So you've got to stand in God. We're to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness and of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the day of evil, and having done all, to stand. Verse 14, stand therefore, stand. So see, this standing is not an advancement. We're not to advance right here. This is a stance. We don't try to attack our adversary. We don't try to fight our adversary. We don't go after him in the name of the Lord. We don't do that. We stand against the wiles of the devil. See, James 4, 7 says this, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Resist the devil. But first, he says, submit. See, when you recognize that you are in Christ, seated with him on the throne, you understand that he is inside of you and you are walking as Christ, you know what's going to come naturally? Submission. Submission comes naturally. And as your submission and under submission unto him and you're doing that he asks you to do, guess what's going to happen? You're going to naturally resist the devil and he's going to flee from you. You don't even have to to lift a sword or anything. He's just going to flee because you're under under submission unto God. That's very important. Because see, when a person is standing, you know what they are? They're established. They're ready. They're grounded, right? They're holding their ground. You know, I like this one here. I've seen it in military movies where you have men fighting up on the front lines, and they're dug in, and the general walks up, and he says, hold the line, hold the line. Don't let anything break through. You need to hold this line. If you allow something to break through here, it could be detrimental what's behind us. Just hold the line. And you know what God is telling us? He's saying, hold the line. Hold your ground. Stand fast. But I'm not going to leave you empty. I'm going to give you everything that you need. He's going to give you the tools that you need in order to have this victory. Your position in Christ, your walk in Christ, your stance with Christ, all has to do with where you are going to be within the battle and with what he's given you to overcome. See, it's a spiritual battle. We can't do this on our own, church. We can lock arms, come together in numbers, but without the Spirit of God, the only thing that's ahead of us in our future is defeat. But with just one person walking in the Spirit, God can move mountains. He can do great things with that. This is a spiritual battle. Verse 12 says, For we wrestle not against the flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is a spiritual battle, but it it reveals itself in a physical way. So we can only overcome 
a spiritual battle and a spiritual adversary with that which is spiritual. That's it, right? So we have been given some spiritual protection here. We talk about we've been given the armor of God, and we're just going to read down through this. We don't have time to do a study in all of this. But when you look at verse 13, it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the day of evil, that in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the, hel uh, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. See, this is the armor that God has given you. You've not been left helpless. But let me tell you, there's a few other things that God has given you. And it's beautiful because you can find it throughout all of Scripture. It says right here in verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Why does it not say Christ? Why Everything else in Christ, as Christ, why does it say God here? Well, one thought might be because Christ is right there fighting with you. In Mark chapter 16, it says when Jesus ascended and sat on the right hand of the Father, that even though he was there, he was working with the disciples. So maybe he's down here fighting the battles with us, side by side with us. Could be. I believe that. But also, when you're in a ba battle, you get the full arsenal of the Godhead. He gives you the full arsenal. He gives you everything from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Well, what is that? Well, I love how this breaks down. See, with God the Father, he gives you the battle plan. He gives you the plan that you need on a daily basis to be able to go out and to have victory. See, he's given you the vision. He's given you that, that battle plan, right? With God the Son, Jesus Christ, he gives you the leadership. He's right there. He's going to lead you through the word of God of where you need to go, where you don't need to go, when to advance, when to back off. See, that's the leadership of Jesus Christ. You know why? He's been there. He's our leader. He's been through the battle. He knows which ones to fight and which ones not to for us. But the Holy Spirit, you know what he gives us? He gives us his intel and his logistics. See, logistics is that supply line of power that comes from up on high as we're walking in the Spirit and we realize we've overcome. The Spirit of God comes down. We have the power to do whatever it is God has told us. And then he gives us intel and he guides us on where to move and where not to as the leaders guiding us also with him. You see that? See, not only do you get the armor, but you get the full battle plan. You get the leadership. You get the intel. You get the logistics. But there's something, a problem that we have on the other side. And I call it the trinity of opposition. That's what it is. It's the imposter of all three of these. You see, Satan, he has a plan for your life. He provides a plan. If you listen to him, he, will, he provides a plan. He's got a plan set out for all of you right now that will end in destruction. The flesh, that provides leadership. See, the flesh, when you give in to the flesh, it's going to lead you places that you never thought in your life you would ever get involved with. But it's a good leader. And then with the world, it provides that intel and that logistics. It tells you when you turn on the TV what you need to be involved in. It gives you the logistics of false power from, from fame and money and all of this. You see how there's an imposter here that's trying to take over our lives when we have the full Godhead and his support and the full armor of God to get us through, guess what? When you add that together, we have overcome. We have overcome. 1 John 2.14 says this, I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him, that is, from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. See, through all of this, we've overcome the world, we've overcome the flesh, now we're overcoming the wicked one. It has no hold upon us. But we've got to understand that. See, we have the word of God. Everything we've just talked about is found right here in Scripture. So if you have the word of God, you have overcome the wicked one. He has no saying in your life. 
Our stance is in God because it's a Godhead's covering that we need in order to have the victory that's been promised. And it reminded me over in Zambia during the rainy season, you see people walking with umbrellas. It seems like a simple illustration, and it is. Because see, in the rainy season, the clouds are there, and they know rain is imminent. It's coming. So just in case it starts raining, they want to be ready. They want to have that protection right there. As soon as rain comes out, they're protected, you see. But here's the thing. When it's not rainy season, you don't see anybody carrying them. You might see a few here and there for the sun, but not very many. See, they, they carry them in the season that they know the rain is coming. That's their protection. And see, that's the way we ought to live. Our Godhead is our umbrella. We are in a season right now that's imminent attacks that's going to happen. And we have to be prepared at any moment to pull out that umbrella and put it up that we can be protected from the adversary. But let me tell you, it's just a season. The season's coming to an end, and one day we won't have to have that protection. And we'll step out from this world into the presence of Jesus where we were meant to be right now as the body of Christ. Amen? So the application of point here, the last application of point, point of application. We are to stand against the wiles of the devil. You will never overcome the spiritual battle until you embrace the full arsenal that you've been given. If you leave out one, you're vulnerable to attack. You leave out two and it's worse. You, see, you need the whole thing. You need to apply the whole thing. So as we're closing out today, everything we just talked about can be found in three verses in the book of Psalms. Sit, walk, and stand. Go ahead and go to that next slide. Psalm chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. I'm going to read through this, and I want you to think about what we talked about and how this really just lays it all out for you. It says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in the law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. And his leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Do you realize that's just what we talked about for the past 45 minutes, that same thing? You, know you want to know how you're going to be blessed? You're going to be blessed if you're not walking, standing, or sitting with the world, with the flesh, or with the adversary. That's how you're going to be blessed. But if you walk with God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and you recognize you're an overcomer, the promise is here, if you love his word and you follow his word, you're going to be like a tree that's planted down by the rivers of water. And guess what? You're going to bring forth fruit. And whatsoever you do is going to prosper. And anything will prosper because God has his hand upon you. See, that's where we're at, church. That's what the church of Ephesus, Paul was trying to get across to them to prevent some things from happening. We are overcomers. I'm going to ask you all to stand. Go ahead and stand. I'm going to pray, and then the music's going to play in the background for a little bit. And it's going to be a time for you to be able to spend some time with your Lord and ask him maybe some things in your life you're struggling with that you haven't overcome yet. I don't know. Maybe you've never placed your faith and trust in Christ. See, guess what? If you haven't, you're still back there in that jail cell. But Jesus Christ will make you free today if you just place your faith and trust in him. This is going to be your time. I'm going to pray, and then there'll be some music, and you can spend some time with him. Father, Lord, we love you, and I'm so thankful for this time. I thank you so much for the church of Ephesus and the love that Paul had for them. But he wanted them to understand about overcoming some things. But what it took was for them to sit and to walk and to stand with their Lord, to understand that the world and the devil and the flesh is all right there trying to disrupt what you're doing. I pray for victory today in this auditorium. I pray your hand will be upon everyone. We thank you so much for the power of God. We thank you how we have overcome. We give you the praise and glory. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.